In the moisture-free air of the Arizona desert lies an Air Force in waiting. It is an older Air Force with a surprising amount of fight left in it. An Air Force that is priceless. Many of these aircraft fought in Europe and the Pacific in World War II and were rolled out to fight again over Korea and now Southeast Asia. These same aircraft are worth fortunes to American taxpayers in spare parts alone. A few planes are worth more today on the open market than they cost us 15 or 20 years ago. There is no other Air Force like it in the world. It not only saves millions of American tax dollars, but it is a reserve air power to be reckoned with. When the contingency arises, they can be prepared for one-time flight to an overhaul facility for refurbishing and return to operational service. Until 1965, the military services maintained separate storage facilities. Then the Air Force Logistics Command was appointed executive director by the Department of Defense in the management of all phased out military aircraft. It now accomplishes this through its single manager operating agency, the Military Aircraft Storage and Disposition Center, known as MASDIC, located at Davis Monthan Air Force Base, Tucson, Arizona. MASDIC's mission is the storage, reclamation, and disposition of aircraft and parts in order to realize the maximum dollar return and still maintain the utmost reserve of air power in these aircraft for future contingencies. The aircraft storage program starts in the Department of Defense, where future needs are determined and decisions made as to aircraft and how many are to be retired from the inventory. Acting on these plans, which reach ahead five years, the services direct that aircraft be withdrawn from the using commands and reschedule them to MASTIC. Over half of the incoming planes are placed on hold status for possible return to active service. The balance are reclaimed for required parts and then sold to the commercial market. Each new arrival immediately undergoes in-processing procedures. Fuel is drained, ejection systems disarmed, classified, and high-value items are removed, interiors cleaned, and inventories taken. To the trained MASTIC crews, these are routine tasks, mastered through long experience. But to the flight crew, it's like saying goodbye to an old friend with whom they have shared countless experiences. Countless hours of airborne alert or reflex duty. For them, the end of one career and the start of another. For the plane, perhaps only temporary retirement before starting a new one. Nearby, other aircraft of nearly every type await their turn. Whether an aircraft is scheduled for storage or reclamation, processing varies little. Systems are drained, flushed, refilled with a corrosion preventative, and sealed. Engine cylinders are sprayed with hot oil vapors, which leave a preserving film inside the cylinder to guard against corrosion. Since deterioration of tires can be expected during the hot summer months, wheels and tires in short supply are changed to old and worn tires for their stay in storage. Canopies and windows are coated with a protective material. All openings are sealed. Indicators are placed in critical areas to show the presence of moisture and fuselages are vented. Preserved aircraft receive periodic attention. Airframes are checked, engines turned over, and systems operated. Because of the nature of its mission, MASTIC gives high priority to preservation research. In this area, desert test program engineers 
conduct controlled studies of corrosion growth and experiment in control techniques. Preservation methods for Navy aircraft vary slightly because of past exposure to salt spray and sea air. But from these experiments, Mastic will develop a standard optimum technique that will apply to all aircraft stored in a desert environment. Meantime, in another area, other aircraft are held for reclamation. Frequently, they are the only source of spare parts for thousands of aircraft throughout the world. In this shelter, three times as long as a football field, using save lists as guides, mechanics strip the airframes of their parts, components, and systems. Smaller items, altimeters, radar sets, compasses, nuts and bolts, hundreds of pieces of hardware, many of them interchangeable, go into supply channels. Engines are on all save lists. When removed, they are placed in special containers to guard against corrosion and other damage. Low time engines may go directly back to operational units for duty on other aircraft. But some engines are reclaimed for parts and still others are sent to overhaul facilities for inventory replenishment. Parts are checked against save lists, cleaned and inspected. Then they are either sent directly into the field or placed in bins pending shipment to repair or storage facilities. In 1965 alone, Mastic reclaimed over 8,000 tons of parts and recovered 1,400 aircraft engines. They are packed and shipped to the proper supply activity where they form a spare parts bank. Even after the old aircraft have satisfied the save lists, they continue to make important contributions. These old birds, called reclamation insurance type or RIT aircraft, may be the answer. For example, in Southeast Asia, an aircraft of an older type returns from a mission badly damaged. No spare is in stock at base level, nor at any area depot. An emergency order goes stateside to the Air Force Logistics Command. The memory files of the electronic data processing system report back no link assembly. Mastic is the last resort. So important are these emergency requests, they take precedence over everything else, over storage and preservation, reclamation and withdrawals. Link assembly is immediately cleaned, thoroughly inspected, tested, and within hours it's on its way to the operational unit. As the months pass, these old planes are gradually cannibalized until only a skeleton remains. They will yield a tail section to an aircraft in Southeast Asia, a wingtip to Latin America, until finally, when everything usable has been salvaged, the remains are sold for what the market will bear. But even here, additional returns are possible. Reduced to ingots, their remains will go into the manufacture of appliances or automobiles, or perhaps even into the aircraft and missiles of the future. Mastic is not a one-way street. 
as some aircraft arrive others depart to ultimately rejoin the active force after perhaps years of storage their systems are given operational checks and a quality control inspection next comes the test flight a job for mastic test pilots who can fly almost anything in the inventory when the pilot has finished checking out an aircraft it's ready for its one-way flight to a repair depot for complete overhaul and there it goes back into the air for a thorough test hop prior to return to service. These test hops ensure its airworthiness before it leaves the mastic. Navy aircraft like this one are sent to overhaul and repair departments, and many of mastic's aircraft eventually go to Southeast Asia. This return to active flying status of these aircraft has brought new life to veterans of past wars. Even the old Goonie Bird, supposedly too old, too slow, and too small, has become an armed dragon. With three electrically driven miniguns, it is capable of firing 6,000 rounds a minute from each cannon, raining four slugs in each square foot of terrain below. With beefed up engines, the B-26 has become even more effective than in World War II or Korea. Bomb racks and guns were installed in the T-28, once used as a pilot trainer. Old Navy aircraft, once considered obsolete, also have resumed a fighting role. However, not all those leaving the desert go back into our military service. In many cases, these aircraft strengthen friendly air forces. From fighters to transports to trainers, hundreds have gone to foreign countries in support of military assistance programs. The Vietnamese government established a commercial airline with C-54s and C-47s received through the Agency for International Development. Some have been sold to aid in humanitarian airlifts, for the carrying of medical teams to out-of-the-way places, for the evacuation of the ill and injured to hospitals, and for the transportation of food and clothing to remote areas. Through the General Services Administration, some are transferred to other government agencies, thus saving the cost of new aircraft. They are even finding a place in the aerospace age. This is the pregnant Guppy, built to transport rocket boosters for NASA. It was put together by constructing a superstructure on a KC-97 airframe. Other KC-97 airframes were converted into cabins for centrifuge operations for aerospace medical research. Experimental flying vehicles depend on components obtained from mastic resources. Then there are the donations to museums, municipalities, veterans organizations, and other groups as public monuments, where they keep alive past memories for generations to come. By realizing the maximum return of dollar value through storage, reclamation, and disposition of these aircraft, the Military Aircraft Storage and Disposition Center 
makes a substantial contribution to cost reduction. Operating on a four-year budget of $17 million, it has returned $734 million to the government, or over $42 for each dollar spent. The military aircraft storage and disposition center is the desert home of our standby aircraft. Veterans paid for, but still worth billions to American taxpayers. Veterans that need only grooming and fueling to fly and fight again. It is truly a desert bonanza.